Hello, welcome today. We thank you and glad that you could join us. We are continuing with session number 52 of our online Bible study out of the Gospel of Luke. Today we are going to return to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, we will be in Luke chapter 15. I hope that you join us each and every week with Bibles in hand and a pad of paper and a pen close by. That way you can jot down your own notes and items of interest that may come to your mind as we go through our study. Today we'll be in Luke chapter 15. Last week we began looking at what has been called the parable of the prodigal son. In this masterpiece, Jesus communicates several lessons to us. I believe the main point of the story is to show us what God is really like. He is not some impersonal tyrant who is too busy to care about you and I. But he is a loving father who has numbered the hairs on your head. He will forgive you when you return to him. We also learn from the story of the prodigal son that if you wander away from God, you can repent and return to his open arms. Now today, we want to turn our attention to the other brother, and we're going to learn another important lesson. Let's review the first part of the parable. A man had two sons, and the younger son demanded his inheritance and he took the money and ran. He went away and he wasted the money on wild living. He ended up broke, hungry, and miserable in the mud and the mess of the hog pen. And when he came to his senses, he confessed to God that he had sinned, and he headed home. He wasn't sure how his father was going to receive him, so he prepared to take the job of a servant. But when the dad saw him coming from a great far off, the father ran to meet the wayward son. And the father embraced the son and showered him with kisses. And the father dressed his son in a new robe and gave him the family ring and put shoes on his feet and killed the fatted calf. And they had a wonderful, wonderful celebration. And it would be nice if the story had just ended right there. But Jesus had a message for the religious Pharisees who were listening in. Let's pick up the story in verse 25 of Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, verse 25. Now his older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, uh, notice that inflection, this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. You know, there's a couple of famous pieces of art that portray this parable. The most famous is the one done by Rembrandt, but I personally prefer the one that was painted by the 17th century Spanish artist uh, Bartolome Esteban Murillo. 
Now, if you'd like to see it, just go to the, the internet and Google the words Murillo, M-U-R-I-L-L-O, Murillo, and prodigal son painting. Just type those words into Google and, you know, a search bar and a photo of that painting will pop up. In Murillo's painting, you can immediately find the father and the prodigal son in the picture. You know, it's in those little details that, that make the painting memorable. The, the prodigal son is gaunt and he's filthy. His clothes are in tatters. His hands are clasping prayer and he has a hopeful look on his face as if he's still wondering, is he going to take me back? And the father is leaning over and embracing the son, oblivious to the dirt and the smell. And I kind of like the little dog that Murillo paints, you know, into the picture. He's jumping at the son's knee. Perhaps that was his puppy at one time. And you can almost see the little tail wagging fur furiously as that puppy welcomes home his friend. And behind the father, two servants are bringing a tray with a fine robe and sandals for the boy. Another servant is holding a ring. To the left, a young servant is leading a fatted calf, and a workman has an axe ready to kill the calf so the feast can begin. It's a joyous scene, except for one face. There to the right in the shadows, Murillo painted the older brother. There's an unmistakable resemblance between the two sons. If you look closely, you'll be amazed to see Murillo painted a smirk on his face. In his eyes and on his lips, you can see resentment and sarcasm. The younger son is on his knees looking up at the father, but the older brother is the highest head in the painting, as if Murillo intended us to understand he was looking down on the whole scene with indignation and anger. You know, I would call the older brother the pouting prodigal. And although he never left his home physically, it's obvious that he had a dysfunctional relationship with his father and with his brother. He represents many religious folks, possibly folks who might be listening and watching me today, folks who haven't sinned against God by running off and going wild. In fact, your life is so tame and so boring that wild living isn't even a part of your vocabulary. You've been around for a long time warming a church pew. But when it comes to really celebrating what God is doing in the lives of other people, you don't rejoice. I'm convinced that there are many more people who show up for church on Sunday mornings who are guilty of the older brother syndrome than are guilty of the younger son's sins. Now, let's just see which brother you are this morning. Let's examine the characteristics of a pouting son. After working all day in the fields, the older brother arrived home only to hear the karaoke music shaking the rafters. And when he learned that the party was for his younger brother's return, he became angry and he refused to participate or even go into the celebration. In his attitudes and his statements, we can find three characteristics of a pouting prodigal. The first characteristic is there was an angry spirit of grumbling. You know, verse 28 tells us he became angry. It's the word orge, which means that he flew into a rage. And when his father came out to plead with him to join the party, he just started gum, uh, grumbling and complaining. The older brother said, well, I never left home, and I never spent all my money on prostitutes, and you've never even killed a small billy goat for me. I mean, can't you just hear the whining in his voice? You know, sometimes 
church folks who have been around for a long time, they start to get jealous when the church starts paying attention to some new people. That's the older brother syndrome. And you can recognize an older brother Christian because they're quick to grumble and complain. You can call them grumblers, uh, complainers. You can call them gripers. And they usually begin a sentence like this. They say, now I don't mean to be critical, but... And that's exactly what they do. They criticize. Hey, I'm not angry at these people. The Father loves them, and I do too. You want to say to them, come on in and join the party. But they'd rather be miserable and, and, and stand on the outside with their arms all crossed and a sour expression on their face. And they say things like, well, Pastor... I don't think we ought to clap our hands in church. And last week, I counted three people that lifted up their hands during a song. I'm afraid we're going to turn into a bunch of them charismatics if we aren't careful. And the funny thing is, these are some of the same people who will go to a football game and they'll lift their hands in their air and they'll shout, Touchdown! Or they'll paint their face and they'll wear a bright green wig or they'll dance around and hoop and holler and they're happy the whole time they do it. But they're afraid things are going to get out of hand in church. Vance Habner used to say, some people are so afraid of getting out on a limb that they never get near the tree. These folks say, well, pastor, we sing too many praise songs. The music's too loud. And pastor, I saw a guy walk down the aisle and he had an earring on. And you got to preach a message against that. I saw some guy show up to church with shorts on. You got to stop that. And who brought the drums into the church in the first place? And by the way, Pastor, our services are way too long. Those Baptists are beating us to all the restaurants. That's how you can spot a product, pouting prodigal ten pews away. They're seldom happy, and they're constantly complaining about something that they don't like. I heard about a Sunday school teacher who told the story of the prodigal son. And she told all about the prodigal returning and the father hugging the son. And the father put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and killed the fattened calf. But the older son refused to join the party. And after the story, it was question time. And so the, the teacher asked the students, said, boys and girls, who was not happy because the prodigal son returned? And one little boy raised his hand and said, the fatted calf. Well, that's funny, but the older son wasn't real happy about it either. Do you know anyone like that in church? <laughs> they just cannot be happy about anything going on. Uh, might I say that maybe you are the older brother who is full of resentment and bitterness. The second characteristic of a pouting prodigal is an inflated sense of goodness. You know, this characteristic can be found in verse 29 of Luke chapter 15. He exaggerated his own goodness, and he exaggerated his brother's wickedness. Five times in these verses, he uses the personal pronoun. He says, all these years, I've been slaving for you. I never disobeyed you. You never gave me a goat so I could celebrate with my friends. And then he compared himself to his brother. And this little brat of yours, he goes off and spends all your money on prostitutes. Now, we're not told in the previous verses that the younger brother actually visited prostitutes. That's just what the older brother said. Perhaps because that's what he might have done. 
See, there's no way he had been totally obedient to his father for all those years. But in his mind, when he compared himself to his wicked younger brother, he was proud of his goodness. You know, in construction, the I-beam is the strongest beam. It's also the strongest temptation for a Christian. And this brother was so full of I, he couldn't see the repentance and the restoration of his younger brother. He was blinded to anything but his own feelings. You know, you can block the light of the mighty sun with a thin dime if you hold it close enough to your eye. You will always mess up when you start comparing yourselves to other sinners. And it's easy to look at people whose sins are open and vulgar and think, oh, I'm so much better than they are. We must remember that there are secret sins of the Spirit as well. Henri Nguyen's life was revolutionized by understanding this point. Nguyen was a religious, moral man, a minister who was proud of his goodness. And God used this passage to show him he was guilty of the sins of the older brother, and it changed his life. He wrote, Looking into myself and then around me at the lives of other people, I wonder which does more damage, lust or resentment. There is so much resentment among the just and the righteous. There's so much judgment, condemnation, and prejudice among the saints. There is so much frozen anger among the people who are so concerned about avoiding sin. You don't have to waste your life on wild living. There are sins of jealousy and pride and anger and resentment that are much easier to hide. The third characteristic that we see of a pouting prodigal is a faulty understanding of what grace is. See, the older brother was just insulted because he really thought... <laughs> I mean, he really thought he was better and he deserved better than the younger son. He thought he deserved a fatted calf or at least a billy coat. He was offended because he thought his brother deserved less. After all, he had been out working in the fields and he had kept all the rules while his brother was off living it up. It just wasn't right. Older brother Christians are big on keeping rules. They are the church folks who have been working in the church for many years, and they think they deserve some kind of recognition or reward for their service. And anytime you start talking about what you deserve, you leave the realm of grace and get into the area of human performance. And most pouting prodigals carry a Bible and they attend church and Sunday school faithfully. And boy, they'll, they'll let you, they'll make sure you know about it too. In Matthew chapter 20, Jesus tells a parable about the nature of God's grace. It's a story of the master who sends workers out to, into his vineyard to work. And he agrees to pay them a dollar for a full day's work. And so they start working at sunrise. And at 9, 9 a.m., he sends some other workers in to help. And then at noon, he sends some more. And then at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he sends even more. And then just before quitting time, at 5 o'clock, he sends out some brand new workers to help as well. Finally, the whistle blows, and it's time for the workers to receive their daily wages. And we'll pick up the story in Jesus' own words, Matthew chapter 20, verse 9. Call the workers and pay them their wages. Start with the last hired and go on to the first. Those hired at five o'clock came up and were each given a dollar. When those who were hired first saw that, they assumed they would get more, but they got the same 
each one of them one dollar. Taking the dollar, they groused angrily to the manager. These last workers put in only one easy hour, and you just made them equal to us, who slaved all day under the scorching sun. Boy, don't that sound like the older brother? And he replied to the one speaking for the rest, Friend, I haven't been unfair. We agreed on the wage of a dollar, didn't we? So take it and go. I decided to give the ones who came last the same as you. Can I do what I want with my money? <laughs> Are you going to get stingy because I am so generous? Uh, I love that. That's out of the message paraphrase. Now, to understand this parable, you've got to remember the audience to whom Jesus was speaking to in verses 1 and 2. They were the tax collectors and the sinners, but there were also Pharisees who were present. Pharisees were hyper-religious men who were full of their own sense of goodness, and they hated the tax collectors like Zacchaeus and Matthew. And whenever they saw a tax collector on the street, they would intentionally cross to the other side. They would call out their names and just spit. Zacchaeus and stomp their foot, you know. And, and so Jesus is telling us that God the Father receives sinners. The Pharisees were trying to earn God's acceptance. And Jesus was teaching them they needed the grace of God too. For some of you, you're like the older brother. You've known the Lord for years, and you have a proud sense of your religious purity. You have forgotten what it is like to be lost, and you think you deserve God's blessings. God's grace is available to anyone who comes to him in repentance. Remember the thief on the cross? He was saved just minutes before he died. And yet Jesus promised him he would be in paradise with him. See, that's grace. The second thing we see in this passage, God's message to the Pharisee in the pew. Sadly, our churches are filled with Pharisees in the pews. Are you one of them? It's easy to think about other people being Pharisees, but what about me? <laughs> Will you stop right now and ask God to examine your heart to see if there is even a shred of Pharisaical spirit within you? Will you pray the words of Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, where the psalmist cries out, "'Search me, O God, and know my heart.'" See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. If you are an older brother type, a Pharisee in the pew, God has some tender words to say to you. In the parable, the father didn't rush out and say to the older son, get yourself in that house right now, or you're going to lose your, your part of the inheritance. No, he tenderly pleaded with him. There are three things that God is saying to the Pharisee in the pew this morning. First of all, I treasure our relationship more than our, your work. See, the father said, you've always been with me. And he was saying, it is not your work that I cherish. It's you. Just knowing you were here at home with me, it gave me a great sense of enjoyment. Can I just say to you, O oh Pharisee, God doesn't want your service as much as he wants you. Remember the story of Mary and Martha? Martha, Martha was just slaving away in the kitchen while Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. She became angry at Mary. See, it's the older sister syndrome. And Jesus said Mary had chosen the one thing 
that will never be taken from her, a relationship with him. You know, some Christians work so hard that they have substituted work for worship. The second thing that the Father says to the Pharisee in the pew, he says, you have access to all my resources. You know, the father told the, the older son, all that I have is yours. And he was saying, if you wanted a billy goat feast, I would have been glad to give you one, but you never asked. And to believers today, he says, you are my heir. You are a joint heir with my son, Jesus Christ. All that I have is available to you right now. You know, sometimes older brother Christians look around and they're jealous because it seems that Christ, other Christians are receiving more blessings than they have. And God says, you have not because you ask not. And sadly, so many believers think that they have to earn those blessings, but it's all a part of God's grace. It's like the woman that I heard about in Europe who scrimped and saved enough money to purchase a ticket on a ship sailing to America. And on the voyage, she looked through the windows into that luxurious dining room and, and saw the scrumptious meals that were being enjoyed. And then she would return to her little room and she would eat the crackers and the cheese that she had brought alone and packed into her suitcase. The crackers soon ran out and the cheese got moldy and the passenger grew hungrier and hungrier. And the day before arriving in America, she was almost fainting from hunger. And she finally swallowed her pride, and she approached a steward and begged for some leftover food. She would be willing to wash dishes or perform any work just to get some food. The steward asked for the woman's ticket, and upon examining it, he said, Madam, when you purchased your ticket, all the food we have been serving was included in the price. She felt like an idiot. All the time, she could have been feasting. Instead, she was starving. And the same is true in the life of the believer. You didn't buy your ticket. Jesus paid it all. But everything you need in the Christian life it was included. And if you are missing out, it's simply because you have not claimed what is yours in Christ. All the power, all the joy, all the peace, all the security, all the love, all the patience you need is available to you. The third thing that God says to the prodigal powders in the pews, it's my party so come and join me. You know, for a long time, I missed what the Father was really saying there in verse 32 of Luke chapter 15. But over the years, as I have read and reread this story out of many translations and Bible versions, it came to me. What the Father was actually saying was, Son, you and I have to celebrate. See, the verb is in the imperative. He was saying, it's not your younger brother's party. It's my party. I'm the one who's celebrating because my son was dead and he's now alive. So you must join me, not for your brother's sake, but for my sake. See, the party was not for the prodigal son. It was for the loving father. That's the point of all three parables that we read in Luke chapter 15. Celebration over lost things being found. And in these three stories, you can see the Trinity at work. The shepherd found the lamb. That's the, like the work of the Son of God. The woman found the coin. That represents the searching work of the Holy Spirit. 
The dad forgave the wayward son. That's the work of God the Father. And in all three of these parables, God was the one doing the celebrating. To every pouting prodigal, God says, come on, join me in the celebration because there is joy in the presence of angels over one who repents. Now, how does the story end? You know, we're really, we're kind of left hanging. Does the older brother spit and stomp off into the fields and continue to nurse his bitterness? Or does he unfold his arms and allow his dad to put his arms around his shoulders and they walk into the house together and celebrate the lost son's return? I believe that Jesus left this story open-ended on purpose because it's up to you, pouting prodigal. <laughs> what are you going to do? <laughs> the door is open, and the father says, check your bitter complaining spirit at the door and come on in and enjoy the party. What a story. <laughs> what applications for us. There are actually three sons in the parable. Did you catch it? There's the younger son who ran away and returned. There's the older son who was full of bitterness and resentment. And then there's the third son, the son of God who's telling the story. He left the father's house to come to a far country of planet earth to die for our sins. He wasn't disobedient. He was obedient unto death. And whether you are like the younger son or you are like the older son or you haven't become a part of God's family yet, will you choose the Son of God today as your Savior? Years ago, I heard an amazing story that may be true or it may be a parable, but it's still a great story. And I've told it here at the church a couple of times. A wealthy man and his son loved to collect rare uh, works of art. They had everything in their collection from Picasso to Raphael, and they would often sit together and admire the great works of art. When the Vietnam conflict broke out, the son went off to war. He was very courageous and he died in battle while rescuing another soldier. The father was notified and he grieved deeply for his only son. About a month later, just before Christmas, there was a knock at the door. A young man stood at the door with a large package in his hands. He said, Sir, you don't know me, but I am that soldier for whom your son gave his life. He saved many lives that day, and he was carrying me to safety when a bullet struck him in the heart, and he died instantly. He often talked about you and your love for art. And the young man held out the package, and he said, I know this isn't much, I'm not really a great artist, but I think your son would have wanted you to have this. And the father opened a package. It was a portrait of his son painted by the young man. And he stared at it in awe, and his eyes welled up with tears. And he thanked the young man, and he offered to pay him for the picture. Oh, no, sir, I could never repay what your son did for me. This is a gift. And the father hung the portrait over his mantle. And every time visitors came from his home, uh, he took them to see the portrait of that son before he showed them any of the other great works of art he had collected. Sometime later, the man died, and there was to be a great auction of all of his paintings. And many influential people gathered, excited over seeing the great paintings and having an opportunity to, co to purchase one for their own collection. On the platform sat the painting of the sun. The auctioneer pounded his gavel, and he said, We'll start the bidding with this picture of the sun. Who will bid for this picture? There was complete silence. 
And then a voice in the back of the room shouted out, we want to see the famous paintings. But the auctioneer persisted. Will someone bid for this painting? Who will start the bidding? $100? $200? And another voice cried out angrily, We didn't come to see this painting. We came to see the Van Goghs and the Rembrandts. Get on with the real bids. But still, the auctioneer persisted. The sun, the sun, who will take the sun? Finally, a voice from the very back of the room came. It was the longtime gardener of the man and his son. He said, I'll give $10 for that painting. Being a poor man, $10 was all he could afford. The auctioneer said, we have $10. Who will bid 20 Another voice hollered out, give it to him for $10. Let's get to the master's. $10 is the bid, the auctioneer continued. Won't someone bid $20? And the crowd was getting extremely angry. They didn't want the picture of the sun. They wanted more worthy investments for their collections. And so the auctioneer pounded his gavel, going once, going twice, sold for $10. And a man on the second row now shouted, Now, let's get on with the real collection. And the auctioneer laid down his gavel and said, I'm sorry, the auction is over. But what about the paintings? And the auctioneer replied, When I was called to conduct this auction, I was told of a secret stipulation in the will. Only the painting of the sun would be auctioned off. And whoever bought that painting would inherit the entire estate, including the paintings. And the man who took the sun gets everything. And indeed, for all of you watching me today, God is saying the same thing. Whoever chooses my son, Jesus Christ, receives it all. Will you choose him today? If you are an older brother Christian, God is saying, I love you. <laughs> I've always loved you. Just loosen up and join my party. Will you ask him to forgive you of your bad attitude and take away your critical spirit of resentment and bitterness? Can you hear the music? Can you smell the feast? God is saying, Come on in. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. Lord, we are so thankful for these familiar stories that we have talked about. It's been one of the most beloved stories that has been preached on and taught from for many years. And Lord, many of us who are, are listening in today, we could probably relate this whole story from, from memory. But, Father, help us not to miss what you're saying. Lord, I pray for those today who might be younger sons. Maybe they are away from God. And God is welcoming us back with open arms if we'll only come and repent. But, Lord, I also pray for some older brother believers today. Maybe they've got a bitter spirit. Maybe they've got a complaining attitude. Maybe they've got things that... Maybe they, they are distracted by today. Lord, I pray that we would set that aside and we would just simply hear the invitation of the Father saying, come and join the party. Lord, we pray today you would just speak to hearts. Help us to identify ourselves in this story and help us to react the way that you want us to, to live. Father, we pray for your help. Today, Lord, we just pray that you would just lead us and guide us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. This coming Sunday, we continue our sermon series entitled 
conversations with Jesus. As we read through the Gospels, we see where Jesus had conversations with many folks who had all sorts of problems. And Jesus would speak to those folks about their problems. And in this series, we want to just listen in and hear what Jesus has to say, both to those he was speaking to and to us today. So we hope that you'll join us, Conversations with Jesus. And don't forget, we'll be back next Wednesday morning, Lord willing, at 10.30 a.m. on Facebook for our live online Bible study from the Gospel of Luke. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.